Tam hej. I can see every face. And I would sometimes hold on to that one of the brass candelabra things. Big. And I, I actually like loved that church with my arms around it and that congregation. I still keep in touch. I'm still on the phone. I still see an odd one now and again. And you know the Lord's still blessing that congregation. And the secret is not by might, not by power, not by ordained ministers with two degrees, but by the Spirit of the living God. And how I love to sing, and I do almost every week, Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. Break me, melt me, mold me, fill me. Spirit of the living God, fall afresh on me. I was reading this week from Jeremiah 18 about going down to the potter's house and the potter's making on the wheel a new and beautiful object, but something goes wrong with it. It's marred and he crunches it up. And I, I believe there's something gone wrong with Scotland over these many decades. Yeah. I think we swaggered into the 60s on the anointing of the Billy Graham Crusades and the great... Saturday night gospel meetings that were everywhere, we kind of swaggered in there thinking we've arrived. Whores like us, no many in there or did. I let Glasgow flourish by the preaching of his words and the praising of his name. And like Samson, we shook ourselves. One day we shook ourselves and went out to do the battles for the Lord and we wist not that the Spirit had gone. Spirit of the living God. Fall afresh on Scotland. Scotland for Christ. The other day, it's just sitting with my Bible, the, the words of an old hymn came into my, my head and I only could think of one line. Chosen, called and faithful for the captain's band. And I believe we need to raise the standard and blow the trumpet of the very hymn, which is number 485. Who is on the Lord's side? Who will serve the king? Who will be his helper? Other lives to bring... I, I, I said to Stevie there, when I said we had a communion table very like this one, in our old building, a memorial to those who died in Govan, congregational church, in the Great War and in the Second World War. And it went up in smoke. And our past has gone up in smoke. John the Baptist was preaching. And I've been preaching from it for a while. If I can find it. In Luke... Chapter 3. It actually says there, now the people, in verse 15. Now the people were in expectation. 
And that's what you see when you see that. You, you turn around to the vast assembly and you say, can you say amen? We expect bad things to happen. We expect the newspapers to be full of bad reports. And that is really an expression of the level of identity that we have with the circumstance around us. But there is a place higher up where the Lord is seated and he's in total command. Now the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not. John answers saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water. But one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fan is in his hand, and he will thoroughly clean out his threshing floor and gather the wheat into his barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. In other parts of the Gospels, when these kind of expressions are being made, the chaff is the wicked who reject the Lord. But I don't think that's what's being said here. The Apostle Paul says, when I was a child, I was involved with childish things. But when I became a man, I put those childish things away. I thank God for the grace that came to me as a young boy and I gave my heart to the Lord. I know I gave my heart to the Lord as a four-year-old. I never looked back from that age. I ended up going to three Sunday schools on a Sunday because I couldn't find a fourth to fit in. And that was in Shettleson. And when we moved to Castle Milk, I spent two or three days walking for miles and miles and miles as a nine-year-old boy till I found the Brethren Assembly, because that's what I was looking for. We were only there for two months. And I remember the Sunday school teacher doing a quiz now, the kids in those days knew their Bibles. And she asked, can you tell me what are the rivers of Damascus that Naaman said he would rather be baptized and dipped in than the River Jordan? And I went, yeah, Abana and Farpa. <laughs> you know, it's just one of the things you know. And you know, we're immersed in a filthy river just now. The River Clyde's getting cleaned up. But I remember the Clyde when it was just full of oil and grease and sludge. I used to go over every day in the wee ferry to work and back. There was lots of wee ferries. And it seems to me spiritually that there's been a river of sludge going through Glasgow. And it's still there clogging the arteries of the Holy Ghost life that we once enjoyed through the work and through the praising of the Lord Jesus Christ. When I became a Christian, and when we all became Christians, in a sense, we were children in the Lord. A child cries easily when he doesn't get his own way. I remember my wee brother walking out of a five apartment house in Castle Oak. He would be about five years old, saying he was never coming back. And we all said to him, because he was so serious. Where are you going, David? I'm going to America and I'm never coming back. And he went away and he was away for about three hours. <laughs> and then he came back in and we said, where have you been? America. <laughs> he, me, he said that. He told us America. When I was a child, I did childish things. 
demand in my own way, look for people to keep me happy and give me a lot of fun, play games with me, give me books that I like to read. But when I became a man, and when we come in contact with the baptism, with the mighty Holy Ghost, like a mighty rushing wind and with tongues of fire. He's burning up the chaff. Now the chaff is good. Do you know the chaff is actually good for the seed? For the wheat or the corn or the rice that's maturing. It needs the outer shell. But it's the outer shell that protects the immature not ripe yet, seed. The, the chaff actually contains calcium, phosphorus, protein and fiber. And it's a world-class horse feed, but not any good for us. And it burns very easily. Thank God. That blessing of the Holy Ghost prophesied by John the Baptist can make us men and women of God. Not we bairns bubbling away and greeting. Not we poor ragged lodies wandering through the tune up the stairs and down the stairs and our wee night goon shivering with the cold, greeting with the pain. Who are we ragged lordy? He's a drunkard's ragged wain. That's the way we sometimes appear, I think, in our own cognition. We, we look and we, we see that we're a, a, a ragged, defeated, miserable, in pain, remnant of a great army that once won many victories and brought great glory to its captain, chosen, called, and faithful to the captain's band. Now that by the Spirit we're taken to a valley of dry bones, the Clyde Valley. And we ask ourselves the question, Can these bones live again? Prophesy to the bones. With the anointing of the Holy Ghost and your childish, my childish attitudes and trappings burned with unquenchable fire, it means... They can't come back because the fire is still burning. The bones will live again. The bones of the martyrs here in Glasgow. It's John Knox. I think I said wish it last week. John Knox, isn't it? Up, and, up the top of the plinth. But there's a dedication to George Wishart at the bottom. As George Wishart was put into the flames, John Knox was his swordsman, was his warrior companion to protect him, and he was ready to fight to the death on his own. And Wishart said before the flames consumed him, go back home to your bairns, John. One burning is enough for today. We have martyrs. As it says in Glasgow Cathedral down near the crypt of St. Mungo about the martyrs who were murdered at Glasgow Cross. It's a declaration to those who did it. And often I stand there and you, you, as you stand there beside St. Mungo's grave and beside or upon Edward Irving's bones the first Pentecostal, I think, in Britain. 
He was a Presbyterian minister, persecuted dreadfully, died at 39 because of the persecution. Standing there with the martyrs and with the saints, but they shall know on the resurrection day to murder saints was no sweet play. I used to go every Monday with my Bible and a notepad and take notes and sit there and listen to what the Holy Ghost had to say. It was like my own church. I belong to Glasgow. In Christ, Glasgow belongs to me and you and all of us. Jesus was the main, the only reason why John was born. Filled from his mother's womb. Announced by the angel Gabriel to his father, unbelieving father. That the child in his wife's barren womb would be a great man. And he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. In one sense, we need to be a John the Baptist generation. He grew up in the wilderness. And the one thing that makes you and I greater than John the Baptist, infinitely greater, even a child of God, Jesus said is greater than John the Baptist. Yet the angel Gabriel said, he shall be great in the eyes of the Lord. John the Baptist says, I'm a voice crying in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. But he says, I knew him not. I never met him. But I knew that if I prepared myself, if I disciplined myself in my diet, in my companionships, in my focus, in my prayers, everything John the Baptist is validated by the old covenant. Everything that comes out of his mouth, every word is validated by the word of God. Not his own ideas. He's blowing the trumpet, heralding. In this wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. It was a political wilderness. Pontius Pilate was in charge and a wicked Herod was in charge. Well, later on, of course. The Pharisees were in charge. The Sadducees, they were the rich, politically elite supporters in some ways of the Pharisees, but have no, had no belief in life after death, didn't believe in a resurrection, did not believe in angels. They were intellectually superior to everybody. So they thought. It was a wilderness, religiously, politically, economically, it was a disaster. Tax collectors were fat. Everybody else was on a pittance. They were under the military rule of a heathen nation. And yet they were God's chosen people. Like us here in Scotland, we believe we're God's chosen people. I do. Billy Graham believes it. St. Patrick believed it. And believe it or not, St. Patrick was born in Scotland, as far as I'm concerned. And I know I've got enough proof. He was captured and went to Ireland. It was a wilderness. We're in a wilderness today. A lone voice. Wow. 
which we need to cry out as well because a revival is coming. Prepare ye individually the way of the Lord. You know, the, the wonderful thing is this. Like Glasgow, we know him not. We know him not. But he came. He came. He came. The chosen Messiah from before the foundations of the earth. The promised King of kings and Lord of lords. God's own Son. The Savior of the world. The Lamb of God who would die on the cross. He came. One man. If John had not been faithful, he would not have come. I'm sitting last night at 8 o'clock. And I believe the Lord said to me, pray for revival without ceasing. And I would add today, behold, he cometh. I even counseled Charlotte in the car. She won't let me drive the car. She hadn't slept all night. She doesn't sleep at all, hardly. But she insisted in bringing me and going back to bed. She'll be back at 12 o'clock. I said, get ready for revival even tomorrow. He came. You know, there are some words that electrify the audience. Eke homo. Pilate to the crowd, behold the man. I believe when the centurion at the crucifixion of Jesus saw how he bore our sins and forgave them, the sins of those who nailed him to the cross, his false accusers, and that heathen centurion of Rome said, surely this is the Son of God. I don't think he said it in a quiet way. You know, I, I was looking at it last night. And I saw him on his knees. And I saw darkness and thunder and an earthquake. And it was with his hands raised up and tears pouring down his face, he said, surely this is the Son of God. And I saw thousands were standing there. Thousands. One of my heroes is the Reverend Tom Allen of Glasgow. I always intended to go and see him. I never did, but I said that to my pal this week. I said, Billy, I never get seeing Tom Allen. He said, you did, Alec. You came with me and we saw Tom Allen. I said, I don't remember. Tom Allen studied at Glasgow University for his MA to prepare for his BD to be a minister in the Church of Scotland. His BD studies had begun and the war broke out and he was called up into the Air Force. He was heartbroken because he failed an eyesight test that meant he was always ground crew. He went in as a, a nobody, but he came out as a lieutenant. And he'll tell you himself in his little autobiography, 
died far, far, far too young. I can remember sitting in a bus going to Mary Hill and reading Tom Allen had died. And he believed that his faith had gone with all it had seen in the war. Others tell me that even then, even during the war, he was always a great Christian, but he didn't feel it. Something had died. He went to no church. During his Air Force career, as far as I'm aware, 1945, Tom Allen was in, well, just outside Paris. He was a lieutenant. And the senior officer was an American. Born again, great Christian. And he said to Tom, will you come to our forces Easter service, it was Easter, 1945. And Tom said, I don't know why I said it, but I said yes. I had no desire to go. But this was such a lovely man and a good companion, senior man. He said, I went, and it was an army church. And when the service was continuing, a big, tall, black American officer went up to the platform to sing. And he sang, Were you there when they crucified my Lord? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And Tom Allen was sitting there going, Of course I wasn't. It was 2,000 years ago. And then the Holy Spirit began to work. And then he began to tremble, tremble, tremble. For he realized that he was there. Tears broke from his eyes. His heart melted. The Spirit filled his life. And he was a man made new. He was never the same. A man sent from God whose name was Tom. I had a man in my church as a young man in Drumchapel who had come from that area of Mary Hill, North Kelvin side, where Tom Allen had his first church before going to the great Tron church, which only had half a dozen members when he went, but they were going to close it. And Mr. Meekin had a son, and his two little names were Tom Allen. You know, our name should be Jesus Christ somewhere. Can you say amen? And then you've got John the Baptist. Electrifying words. The Lamb of God. Behold the Lamb of God. Eke homo. Behold the man. Surely This is the Son of God. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Yes, we have to prophesy to the bones. Yes, we will see the army arising. But unless it's filled with the Spirit, it will go nowhere. I believe the Lord's preparing us, powerfully preparing us. I, I checked my... Google this week 
and ask the question, what would happen if the wind doesn't blow? And right away I got up. Everybody dies. Everybody dies. It said the trees, the plants, the animals, everything dies. There's a spirit moving there. Somewhere, somehow. In many parts of our land, the spirit seemed to not blow. We have to be born of the water and of the spirit. Last week I had a, a kind of vision while the praise was going on in the church and I saw two hands reaching out and there was a beautiful porcelain dish in the hands that I saw and a, and a, a delicate lid with a little knob and it was obviously like best china. There was a very gentle little design on the porcelain dish and it slipped and fell. And it was ruined. But I knelt down. I assume it was me It was holding it. And I, I, I collected the broken pieces. And when I stood up again, it was perfectly restored. Made, marred, made again. Lord, do it again. And he will. Where you there, when they crucified my Lord, were you there, when they crucified my Lord, oh, sometimes it causes me to tremble. Tremble, tremble. Were you there when they crucified my Lord? When Jesus approached John and requested baptism, John said, it's not you that needs baptizing, it's me. You baptize me. Jesus said, let all righteousness be fulfilled. What I'm just going to say now, as I close, we have to fulfill all righteousness. Tells us in, isn't it, 1 John, there are three things that bear witness. The water, the blood, and the spirit. And from Exodus 29, we see how a man was initiated into either the the high priesthood, which is Aaron, but also how we become priests unto God in the economy of God. And it has to be by water, the blood, and the spirit. And if we're going to preach, we've got to live it. The initiate the one to be consecrated and inducted into the holy robes of priesthood. Just a normal priest with white robes, linen robes. Before they enter into the sanctuary, 
They are totally immersed in water, bathed, bathed, declaring purity of heart and spirit. Then they came in and the blood was applied to their ear, their big thumb and their big toe. And then they were given a white linen robe that covered them. Then it happened to Aaron, that's for sure. Beautiful robes, oil was poured over the head of the initiate. Until this was done, they could not minister unto God nor the people. And that oil would run right over their beautiful linen clothes, over Aaron's garments. May the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. All his wondrous compassion and purity. O oh, thou Spirit divine, all oh, my nature refine as a fire till the beauty of Jesus be seen in me. There will be no revival until we are refined in the fire and the chaff is gone. Like the gold being purified in the crucible, the scum rises, the scum rises, the chaff is removed, the, and then the master craftsman looks and he sees his face reflected in the purified gold. Not by might, nor by power, only by my spirit, saith the Lord of hosts, the Lord of Sabaoth. And there will be a mighty host and a glorious army in Glasgow.